All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my in-class video sounds hilarious. Uh, I truly apologize for anyone who joined the, the Zoom link and had to experience that. I did call uh, the technology team, and they're going to send someone out and try to fix it before Wednesday's class. Um, and so, yeah, my best guess is maybe a cable or something like this, because, yeah, I mean, the, the audio is all messed up uh, in the video and everything. So I hope to have this fixed and I hope that we can still have these Zoom classes together. But as promised, um, you know, I'm going to make a video. And, and so I'm re-recording it here in my office um, to kick things off, you know, so that hopefully you saw this welcome video and we went over the syllabus and the schedule and stuff like this. Uh, in today's class, we are going to be covering some math. And so maybe I'll just kind of reiterate here in the schedule, right, that um, we you probably should only see one of those, um, you know, so that, uh, you know, you're not confused. But we have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class with Thursday recitations. Today, we're covering 12.1 and 12.2 in class. Uh, and so ideally, right, there's some pre-class videos, some pre-work that I want you to do before coming to class. And so you should do that for watch the pre-class videos for 12.1 and 12.2. And then in Wednesday's class, right, you should watch the, the pre-class videos uh, for 12.3 and so on and so forth. So this should tell you kind of what uh, topics we're covering. Now, these section numbers, they are the same section numbers in our textbook. Um, and they're also the same section numbers in my class notes. So the class notes, right, just to kind of reiterate, you probably saw this in the welcome video, but we're going to go to the class notes slash videos. We're going to go to my stuff here um, for McCombs. I'm lecture one and two, and you can download the notes. Uh, and then you can also watch the pre-class videos. Uh, and so the notes are, are pretty friendly in that they do say kind of very specifically, right, uh, these are the notes that go along with the video before class. This is what we're going to be doing in class here. Uh, and this is kind of one of the, the rare sections, just kind of with the, the introduction and everything here that you can see in 12.2, we actually won't do anything during class here in 12.2. 12.2 is all about vectors. Uh, and I found that this is largely uh, prerequisite stuff. Many students know something about vectors already. And so it's very possible that you'll be very bored during uh, these videos. But um, I've decided to spend my time in class uh, going over the 12.1 stuff uh, and 12.2. If you're less familiar with vectors, if you need some refresher, right, there is some uh, some videos to help you out. But this is, you know, uh, not even the you know crazy stuff with vectors like dot products and cross products and all that sort of stuff. This is you know adding vectors together, uh, scaling them, stuff like this. So um, again, largely, uh, I found that students kind of are, are bored with this, and so I think that we can spend our class time uh, maybe. A little bit better uh, talking more about surfaces. So that's what we're going to do in today's class. All right. Uh, other than that, right, uh, the Please make sure that you do read through the syllabus, know how you're graded, all that sort of stuff. Uh, in the Thursday recitation, where you'll be breaking up into smaller groups and whatnot, uh, this is where you'll have a chance to kind of talk more about the syllabus and do some review and all that sort of stuff. So, um, but again, make sure you do look at it. It is a comprehensive syllabus. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here and switch it over to my iPad. Your screen. And so usually how I begin classes, um, right, we won't go over the syllabus and the schedule every single day or anything like this, but usually I spend time about five minutes or so going over the pre-class notes, right, things that you should have watched before coming to class, uh, just as kind of a quick review uh, to kind of make sure that everyone's on the same page and get you thinking about math again, all that good stuff. Um, and so here are our pre-class notes for 12.1. 12.1 is all about this three-dimensional coordinate system. So now instead of just X's and Y's, we also have Z's, right? So X's, Y's, and Z's. Um, and so we have kind of a, a few definitions that go along with this. Not only do we have an X-axis and a Y-axis, we also have a Z-axis. The origin is still 0, 0, 0 now with th three coordinates. So 0, 0, 0 is the origin. That's kind of in the middle there. Um, and the Z-axis is not random. You have to be kind of a, a bit careful when it comes to the Z-axis. And you need to use the right-hand rule, right? So you kind of, you're going to hold up your right hand. Um, and you want your fingers for your right hand to go first through the X-axis, then the Y-axis. So again, the ordering does matter here. Uh, and then your thumb should be pointing in the direction of the positive z-axis. So again, kind of if I use my right hand here 
and I have my fingers for my right hand curling through and first hitting the positive x-axis, then hit the positive y-axis. Again, my thumb should be pointing in the positive z-axis. So that's why the positive z has to be pointing up in this case. Um, on the other hand, if you were to reorder these and write, you don't put X on the left and Y on the right, maybe you kind of redo this and you say, I want my Y to be on the left and I want my X to be on the right. Uh, well, in that case, right, if I was to go through the, the X axis first, the positive X axis, then the positive Y axis, and I was to go in this direction with my fingers on my right hand, you'll see that my thumb is actually pointing down now. Um, and so this does become more important later on when we're dealing with cross products and all that sort of stuff. Uh, largely, I'm just going to be drawing the same picture over and over and over again. So if you don't want to uh, kind of go crazy with this right hand rule stuff, I would just always draw the X on the left, Y on the right, and then Z up. And that's kind of quite safe. Uh, but we will need to, the right hand rule more and more for 12.4 and even later on in the course in chapter 16 eventually. Uh, we defined octants, right? When you take three dimensional space and you break it up, uh, with the coordinate planes, you get eight pieces rather than four pieces. So instead of quadrants, you have octants. Uh, and we have defined a first octant, but there isn't really a second octant or anything like that. So that was a little bit about the definitions. Again, I'm doing the quick like five minute version, but the longer version, right? This is all part of the pre-class video. So again, I recommend if you haven't watched that to spend time watching that. And I go through this in much more detail. Um, then we're going on to graphing points. So points now, we have an x-coordinate, a y-coordinate, and a z-coordinate. So we need to go one out in the x-direction, negative two out in the y-direction, and three up in the z-direction. And so this was my best attempt at that, going one out in the x, left two in the y-direction, and then up three in the z-direction. And our main goal in today's class is we're going to be graphing collections of points, aka mainly surfaces. Um, the last bit here is that um, we are doing real valued calculus. So everything is the real numbers. So that kind of script R there, that's a, uh, stands for the real numbers. Of course, you know something about complex numbers. We've had some complex numbers in algebra and whatnot. And luckily we're not doing that. Uh, eventually, you know, there is complex calculus. It's, I think it's math 432 or something like this uh, here at MSU. So, I mean, it does exist. You can take that class, um, but that's not going to be the, the math that we're doing. So we're going to stick into the real numbers, uh, which is quite nice. So this is basically just saying that uh, x is a real number, or the first coordinate is a real number, the second coordinate, or y, is a real number, and the third coordinate, or z, is a real number. So r cross r cross r, you can shorthand that with r cubed. So that's telling you something about the coordinates here, in this case, that they're all real numbers. And this will define our good old three-dimensional coordinate system. All right, so uh, with that, this is where I would normally transition into the in-class videos. And so, uh, you know, typically if we're in class or whatnot, I would ask if there are any questions and things like this. Of course, if you do have questions, you can post on Piazza uh, and I'd be happy to uh, respond to them. But hopefully this has been a quick, nice overview. And now we can get into the new stuff for today. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about, first of all, surfaces in space. So we did points in space and we graphed those. And now we're going to do collections of points. Um, and even kind of before I get to that, uh, I want to back up and think about some algebra that we did. Uh, well, back in maybe our favorite algebra class. Right. And so I'm going to think about how to determine if this point here is on this equation. In this case, it's a line equation. Uh, and of course, right nowadays, uh, you've had quite a bit of algebra. You could sketch this equation for this line here and you could sketch the point and you could actually just see right maybe it's off of the line in which case you would say no this point is not on the line or maybe it is on the line right and you sketch that and you see that they intersect and you say yes this point is on the line but even without being able to sketch it the claim is that we can determine if this point's on the line using algebra and so how we need to do this right if this point's on the line well, then it must satisfy the equation of the line, right? Because when we graph an equation, it's the collection of points that satisfies that equation. And so I have an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, and I have a place that I can plug in X's and Y's, right? So everywhere I see an X, I'm gonna plug in one. And everywhere I see a Y, I'm gonna plug in four. And the question is, when I plug these things in, does this satisfy our equation? In this case, does it equal one? And so in our case, right, we get negative 15 equals one. And so we can see that no. So in this case, if we were to sketch these, we would see indeed that the line and this point, right, are not intersecting, right? So the, the point is not 
on the line. So we can use that algebra to tell us something graphically, right? So that algebra that we did right there, the fact that negative 15 is not equal to one, tells us graphically that this point is not on that line. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I'd like to play the same sort of game but in now three dimensions. And in three dimensions, I don't know how to graph this right now, right? Later on in our class, we will talk about how can we maybe graph this. Um, but as of right now, I, I don't know how to graph it. And so I can't do the graphical approach where I sketch it and I sketch the point and I look at that and I say, are these two things, right? Is this point actually on this plane, right? Do they intersect? Um, and so, but we do still have the algebra. And so I'm gonna go ahead and use the algebra here. Again, now we have an X, a Y and a Z coordinate. And so I can go ahead and plot these things, or sorry, plug them in there. Um, and so we have one minus four and everywhere I see a Y I'm putting a four and everywhere I see a Z I'm putting a two. And the question is, does that equal one? And so we get one minus 16 plus 16. And ooh, I can tell already that yes, that this does work out. We get one is equal to one. And so the answer would be yes. So if I could sketch this out, right, I would see that this point is indeed on this plane, that they do intersect. And moreover, this can be done for even more complicated things. So here is a surface. I don't even know what this looks like. I need to use some fancy graphing technology, you know, in order to figure out what this surface even is. It's some weird cubic -y surface thing. So I don't even know what this is, but still, I want to be able to answer the question, is this point actually a part of the surface? And so the strategy is the exact same. Everywhere I see an X, I'm going to put a 1. Everywhere I see a Y, I'm going to put a negative 3. Everywhere I see a Z, a Z I'm going to put a 0. And I'm going to plug these things in and see if they satisfy the equation or not. And in this case, I get that 1 is equal to negative 3. And so that's complete nonsense. No, uh, this point is not on the surface. So you can see that you can do this even for quite complicated surfaces. All right. So moving on, remembering that, um, you know, if a point satisfies the equation of the surface, that's what it means for it to be on the surface. And so now I'd like to start graphing collections of points, right? I'd like to graph full on surfaces in three dimensions. So my end game here is part B, but again, we're gonna kind of get a running start here. And I'm gonna talk about, uh, again, how we may have done this in our first time or so back in our algebra days. And so for this, let me go ahead and draw the X, Y plane. After all, I'm trying to sketch this right now in the X, Y plane. And what I found for, Thinking about this in three dimensions and sketching these things in three dimensions, it's really useful for thinking about a equation uh, as a restriction, right? So that's what really equations are. In this case, we don't have any restriction on X, right? There is a restriction on Y. In this case, Y must be equal to one. So X can be anything it wants, right? There's no restriction on X. X could be zero. X could be five, X could be one or two or whatever, right? X can be anything, but Y value, the Y height here in this case, right, needs to be equal to one. So any of these points do satisfy uh, this equation. They would all be points on, in this case, it's a line, spoilers, right? Uh, you probably already knew that. Um, but these collection of points will form a nice straight line. In fact, if you think about like the y equals mx plus b that we know and love from our algebra days, right, you would say that this is a line with slope zero and y intercept of one, right? So the big thing, we have a nice line. You could even say horizontal line, something like that. But this right here is going to form a line. And so again, what I want you to think about is that the y equals one is a restriction. It's restricting down what y can be. There are no restrictions on X, so X can run free, right? When X runs free, notice it goes left and right. So I'm kind of even thinking about having a point here, you know, uh, where at a height of Y is equal to one. And I'm kind of thinking about taking this and allowing X to run free. X can literally move this point. And if you were to collect all of these points as we run back and forth, right? This is what forms our line. All right. so. Now I would like to take this and upgrade using those ideas into R3, right? That's the space. So X's, Y's, and Z's. Which by the way, if you wanted to, the X, Y plane, you can denote this as R2, by the way. So this is X's and Y's only. Um, and again, X's and Y's are real numbers each. 
So, all right, so y equals one. So first of all, let me go ahead and draw my three-dimensional space. Again, I'm always gonna start with x's and y's like that. And then with that, my z's can be uh, going up, which I kind of like. All right, so in this case, again, thinking about restrictions, we have a restriction of y is equal to one. So x can be anything. There are no restrictions on x. Z can be anything. There are no restrictions on Zs, but there is a restriction that Y needs to be equal to one. So if I was thinking about a point to plot, right? Maybe a nice one would be zero, one, zero, right? Again, X being zero, so I haven't gone out any in the positive X direction. Z being zero, so I haven't gone up any, but Y needs to be equal to one. So, right, Y needs to take out one step in the Y direction. So something like this. All right. But of course, right, there are many, many points that would satisfy y is equal to one. For instance, x can really be anything that it wants. There are no restrictions on x. So I could run free in my x direction, right? So x could be equal to one or two or three or negative one, negative 100, right? X can be anything that it wants. And the only restriction is that y must be one step out, right? We must take one step in the y direction. So any of these would satisfy this equation. Likewise, right? I chose X there, but we could have chosen Z, right? Z can be anything that it wants. So Z, when things run free in the Z direction, right, they're going to go up and down. So this would be when Z is equal to one or two or three, negative one, so on and so forth. Z can be anything that it wants because there aren't any restrictions on Z. So all of these points, again, so long as we take a step out one in the Y direction, uh, we've satisfied our equation, our restriction. But also we can do any combination of these things, right? We could do X is equal to one and Z is equal to one, right? There are no restrictions on these. So we could do stuff like this. And so we could take a nice, like any of these lines here. And when you accumulate all of them together, we end up forming a nice vertical plane. So this right here, our nice vertical plane is what Y equals one is in X, Y, Z space. So this is a plane, or you could say a vertical plane. With distance one away. Oops. From the X, Z plane. So here's our X and Z. Right, those two together form the XZ plane, as we saw in the pre-class video. And this is just distance one away from that plane there. These uh, I found, uh, you know, this type of problem is a good problem to do in class or do together. Um, but I found that it's not a particularly great quiz or exam question because it's a little bit vague, right? What are the best words possible? Do you need to say that it's a vertical plane or is it okay to not say that? Is it okay to, I mean, I decided to say distance one away from the X to Z plane. Is that possible? Is that needed? Um, is that better than some other phrasing, right? And so again, this is a good problem to do in class, but uh, it's a little bit vague. What do you mean by best possible wording? Uh, and so I find that this is not, would not be really appropriate for a quiz or for an exam. All right, I would like to play the same sort of game here, uh, but now with a different uh, structure. So again, I'd like to start off and maybe my end goal is to be able to graph this uh, X squared plus Y squared equals four in three dimensions. Uh, but maybe I'd like to first start off by doing this in two dimensions and then working our way up. So um, for this one, and maybe this would be a, a good time for this entire example here. Uh, why don't you pause the video and I'd recommend that you try both of these on your own, see how far you can get. And when you're ready for, uh, you know, spoilers, right? You can go ahead and unpause it and we can do this one uh, together. So if you would, please, you know, try this one on your own. And I find that that's, uh, you know, a useful strategy, especially for doing videos. I, I personally do this quite a lot with videos. Um, if I'm trying to learn something, um, that way kind of it emulates better, like if you're doing this on the, the homework or the uh, quiz or exam or something like this, like what do you really understand? So anyway, try to pause this video, see how far you get, and then we can unpause. All right, so I went ahead and I wrote out some uh, things, some ideas here. I I'm hoping that when you saw this, 
that your mind went back to your algebra days and you thought about this good old equation, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, right? This is the classic equation for a circle uh, or more general, right? If you want a circle with a different origin or a different center, right? This uh, x minus h quantity squared, y minus k quantity squared equals r squared, right? This would be uh, kind of if you had a different center rather than just zero, zero um, for your center. So, but this is gonna be a circle of radius two centered at the origin. And now I have drawn uh, the picture for it. So same sort of game here. I'd like you to try to sketch this and you can think back to our problem one six, right? Uh, and things running free in dimensions and all that sort of stuff, right? How can you graph x squared plus y squared equals four in three dimensions? So again, please go ahead and pause the video, see how far you can get. Uh, and then I'll spell the surprise just after this. All right, so. Uh, in this case, we end up with a circular cylinder. And so when I did this in class and walked around, I saw many, many people kind of started off with a nice circle in the XY plane. Right. So this is kind of uh, similar to here in our good old XY plane. We have the circle. But then so. In the xy plane, we haven't taken any steps in the z direction, right? We haven't gone up any, we haven't gone down any, right? Z is equal to zero in the xy plane. However, there aren't any restrictions from this equation on z, right? Sure, x and y are related to one another, but z can be anything, right? And so if we allow z to roam free, it goes up and down. And so z could be equal to one, or z could be equal to two, or z could be equal to negative one, or negative 100, or anything, right? It goes on forever. And in each case, right, if you try to plug in z equals one into this equation, there's no place to plug in z, right? And so you just get x squared plus y squared equals four. So that's a circle. So in the plane, z equals one, you would get a circle, still a circle of radius two, all that sort of stuff. But now it's hovering up a step, right? And z equals one. And this keeps on going on, z equals 2, z equals 5, whatever. And so this will end up forming a circular cylinder when you take the collection of all of these points. Uh, it has radius 2 still, and it's parallel to the z-axis, right? So it runs kind of parallel in that z direction. Uh, of course, you could draw some that are running parallel in the x direction, right, and going out like this. But that's not this case. So ours is running parallel in the z direction. So again, uh, this is a fine problem to do in class. And I think kind of visually it's, it's nice, but uh, again, for a quiz and exam, are those the best words possible? Did you have to say circular cylinder? Could you have just said cylinder? Uh, did you need to include which way it's parallel to all that sort of stuff? So again, good problem to do in class, but um, maybe a little bit ill-defined for a quiz or for an exam. And just as an FYI, kind of in general, uh, we're not, you know, uh, I understand artistic uh, capabilities may vary, right? And we don't want to really get in the habit of grading people's pictures. Um, and so we kind of, you need to be able to draw things good enough so that you understand, you know, um, but quite often we're not looking to draw anyone's pictures. All right, uh, this is one that I didn't have time to do in class, but uh, well, one of the beauties of doing this outside of class is that uh, we can spend some time on it. So I'd like to go ahead and graph the equation uh, z equals y squared and describe it in words as best as possible. Uh, and like it mentions kind of right down below here, uh, it turns out this will get used even more in like 12.6. So let's do this one together. Uh, in particular, so in this case, I see that we are missing an x variable. So if I was to graph this kind of in two dimensions, the right dimensions to use would be our y and our z, right? So that would be kind of in my two-dimensional case, uh, because those are the variables that we have. We have y's and z's. Before, we had x's and y's. And so it made a lot of sense to graph this in the x, y uh, plane. But when you have y's and z's, you should probably graph this in the y z plane. Otherwise, you don't get much of a picture at all. So uh, if I was to go ahead and graph y uh, squared equals z, well, really what I'm thinking about is our good old algebra days. I was pretty good at graphing, for instance, y equals x squared, right? So my independent variable is x. Independent variable is usually the horizontal one, so this horizontal here. And my y it was the vertical, right, the dependent variable. So now these have different names, right? So z is my dependent variable, and y is my independent variable. But still, right, uh, same sort of strategy here. And in fact, you know, if you are ever hesitant about graphing these things, right, you can go back to the same way that we kind of 
graphed many things for the first time uh, in our algebra days, and that's the point plotting method, right? So the point plotting method is you made a table. In this case, we would have maybe Ys and Zs, and you would choose some values. So maybe I could do negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. And we plug those quite literally into our equation and see what comes out, right? So I chose values for uh, things to input for y, and I'm going to see what I get for z. So if I plug in negative 2 everywhere, I see a y. I'd have negative 2 squared for my z value, that would be 4. And likewise, if I have negative 1 for y, if I plug that in, negative 1 squared, that's going to be positive 1 for z equals. 0 squared would be 0, 1 squared would be 1, 2 would be uh, 2 squared would be 4. So again, I'm just plugging those into my equation here and seeing what I get out. So now I have y, z coordinate pairs. And so I can plot those. So for instance, negative 2, 4. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. So I get a point like that. Negative 1, 1. So negative 1 in the y direction. So that's left. And up 1 in the z direction. There we go. 0, 0. 1, 1. 2, 4. So the same algebra that we knew about x's and y's, of course, can still be used for y's and z's. So there is a parabola in the yz plane. So of course, my goal is to graph this in three dimensions, right? So I'm going to go ahead. Here is x, here is y, here is z. And just like, you know, uh, when I walked around and did the circle problem, I saw a lot of people draw, you know, kind of our picture in this case, it was in the xy plane, right? That circle in the xy plane. And so people usually started with a circle and that's a good instinct. So we're going to do that here. In our yz plane, we had a parabola that opens in the positive z direction. So we had something that looks like this. There was our parabola opening in the z direction. Now notice that there are no x's involved with this. There are no restrictions on x. So x can run free. And it can quite literally take this parabola here. And I'm going to go ahead and maybe copy and paste. I hope I got it all. No, I didn't. Let me go ahead and uh, undo that. I want to get a nice. It goes all the way across. There we go. All right. So now copy, paste, and I can offset this in the x direction. Maybe x is equal to 1 or x is equal to 2. Right, so I can take steps out, you know, uh, in the x direction. And again, when I go to try to plug those into my equation, there are no x's. It's independent of x. And so I just get a copy of that same parabola, but now just shifted over. And you can also go in the negative direction, right? We could go back here. So this kind of looks like, I don't know, I feel like I see some like dinosaur ribs or something like that uh, in some cartoon. Uh, but we get this kind of infinite parabola that goes out of the page here. So let's go ahead and maybe shade it a little bit, something like that. There we go. So that is our picture. And again, what are the best words to go ahead and describe this? Um, well, we'll find out in 12.6 some better words to use, but it turns out this will be called a cylinder, which is funny because you don't usually think of a cylinder uh, that looks like this. And that's why I specified up here a circular cylinder, because uh, we will have kind of a broader definition of what it means to be a cylinder here in Calculus 3. Um, and this is, uh, I guess, if you wanted to be very specific, it's going to be a parabolic cylinder, and it's parallel to the x-axis. So it runs parallel to the x-axis, and that cylinder, uh, right, it's a bunch of parabolas. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and jump into our next subsection, final piece for today. We're going to need to talk a little bit about spheres. So with spheres, uh, as I mentioned here, uh, there's quite a few times in the class where if we know something about uh, how something in two dimensions is defined, that we can uh, upgrade into three dimensions <clears throat> by just sprinkling in some Zs. Uh, and this is indeed one of those times. A lot of the sphere stuff here, you'll see uh, that basically if we sprinkle in some Zs, uh, it will upgrade appropriately. So we have the distance between a couple of points, 
this is how kind of the, the talk about circles, uh, and in this case, spheres, kind of always talks is a, about a distance between points because uh, these things are very geometric in their definition. And so we need to talk about a restriction of a uh, speci specified distance, you know, between a couple of points. So if we have a couple of points and we have uh, three coordinates, right, these are in space. Um, well, if they were in two dimensions only, right, the distance formula between points goes like this, x2 minus x1 squared, y2 minus y1 squared, all under a square root. But now, because we're in the three-dimensional coordinate system, you would probably guess, well, we need to include in our z's, right? Maybe z2 minus z1 quantity squared. And let's go ahead and throw that in a square root as well. And it turns out this is exactly the right uh, definition. This gives the, uh, the right formula uh, for the distance between two points. Now, um, you can prove that this works out uh, as one would expect. And to do that, you would use the Pythagorean theorem. So the Pythagorean theorem will prove that this does indeed give the distance between two points. Um, and in fact, for the three-dimensional case, uh, you'll need to use the Pythagorean theorem twice. And so um, but that's how one can prove that this uh, gives a good formula. So let's go ahead and try to use it. Um, let's say that my first point here, this will be x1, y1, z1, and my second point will be x2, y2, z2. And so my distance, which maybe I'll denote by d, is going to be x2 minus x1 quantity squared, y2 minus y1 quantity squared, z2 minus z1 quantity squared, all added together and thrown inside of a square root. So let's see, 2 squared will be 4. Negative 3 squared will be 9. Negative 3 squared will be 9. So this will be 18 plus 4 will be root 22. So my distance between these two points is root 22. So like I mentioned, we bring up distance. Really, I'm interested in talking about spheres. But spheres get a very geometric definition, right? So with three-dimensional distance, if we define the set of all points that are equidistant from some center point. Um, this will form a sphere, so aka a sphere, a set of points in three dimensions that are a set distance away from a center. Um, so let me tell you about the equation for a sphere. So if you want a sphere with a specified center, so rather than just hk, right, we have hkl because we're in three dimensions uh, and with a radius r. Well, if you use the same equation that we had for a circle, so h x minus h squared, y minus k squared equals r squared. Uh, you get very close. But uh, again, this is one of these times that you just sprinkle in the z's. z minus the z coordinate of the center, l quantity squared. Uh, and this indeed will give us the right formula for a sphere. All right, so with spheres, there are two main types of problems that you're likely to see on our homeworks and consequently the quizzes and exams and whatnot. Um, one is, if I give you a radius and a center, can you give me an equation for a sphere? So in this case, uh, this problem is specifying a radius and a center and would like to get the equation. Uh, and the other type of problems is going in the, the other direction. So start off, I give you an equation. Can you tell me the center and the radius? So let's do those two types of problems here to finish off today's class. So if I have a specified radius of two and a specified center, right, my h, k, and l value, I can go ahead and plug these things into the formula. So the main thing is, do you remember the formula or not? So x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared. So in this case, y minus a negative 2 is the plus 2 there. And then z minus l quantity squared is equal to r squared. 2 squared would be 4. So I personally like uh, when students leave their final answers like this. Don't try to expand out or all that whatnot, uh, just because, first of all, you could make a algebra mistake or a arithmetic, really, mistake uh, when you're simplifying and accidentally get the wrong answer. Uh, but also, from a grading standpoint, it's very clear uh, where you're trying to plug in for your center and for your radius. So it's much easier for me to look at this um, and grade and see if it's right or wrong. All right. So on the flip side, we have an equation now. And from that equation, I'd like to figure out 
uh, really the radius in the center. So again, I kind of went back and I used the same words as we had in our other types of problems for our surface. Um, but I'd like to describe this surface as best as possible. So that's going to, well, we can see that it's a sphere. And so I should maybe mention what the radius in the center is if I want to describe it as best as possible. So if you'd like to, you can go ahead and rewrite this. Uh, it's a little bit silly, but only a little bit. Right. And now you can really see what your H is, your K is, your L is, and your R. All right. So this is going to be a sphere um, of radius one centered at zero, zero, zero. All right. So just like we have the unit circle back in our trig days or algebra days or whatnot, uh, you could call this a, the unit sphere. Okay, a little bit more difficult now. Describe this surface as best as possible. So, I mean, we're in a, a section about spheres, so I'm thinking it's probably going to be a sphere, uh, but we can see that it's a little bit more complicated, right? Really, I would like to get this into a form, x minus h quantity squared, y minus k quantity squared, z minus l quantity squared is equal to r squared, right? I'd like to get it into this form because then I would know what the center is and what the radius is and all that sort of stuff. So the question is, how do I take x squared minus 2x and turn it into a perfect square? Well, the way that we did this back in our algebra days, right, we had a technique for this and that was called completing the square. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing here. And so uh, we're going to do this for each variable. We're going to add on some quantity to complete the square. Uh, this y uh, actually doesn't have any uh, linear term, right? There's no like 2y or something next to it. So this is already a completed square. We could write this as y minus 0 quantity squared right now. Um, but then the z's, right? z squared plus 4z. We're going to want to add something to that to make a perfect square. So. The question is, what do we add in order to get a perfect square? And so, yeah, this is a uh, something that you went over in algebra a long time ago. Good thing to review. Uh, the technique goes for completing the square is that you look at the coefficient by the linear term. So if I look at that coefficient, negative 2, I divide that by 2 and I square it. And there's kind of a very nice geometric reason about why this works. Um, but so it's kind of up to you if you, you know, go back and relearn that geometric reason about why this is the thing to do, or you can just memorize this. Um, and so if I go ahead and I simplify this down, this would be negative one squared. When I square negative one, I get one. So my claim is if I add a plus one here, that now this piece right here is a perfect square, aka when I factor it, right, when I factor this, um, you would get x minus one times x minus one. So that is a perfect square. It is x minus 1 quantity squared. So I could go ahead and maybe put in here x minus 1 quantity squared. All right, we already knew that the y's, uh, no work to do there. It's already a perfect square. Uh, for the z's, same sort of strategy as before. We're going to take a look at our uh, coefficient for our linear term, right? The linear term just means that this is z to the first power. Uh, so that's the linear piece. Uh, the z squared, right, that's going to be the quadratic piece, right? It's raised to the second power. So we took it the, the coefficient from the linear piece, 4. We're going to go ahead and divide that by 2 and square it. So it's going to be 2 squared happens to be 4. So I'm going to add on 4. So again, my claim is we've done, by following this uh, strategy for completing the square, we have actually made a completed square, a perfect square here. And so if you factor this, you'll get z plus 2 times z plus 2, right? And so if you'd like to, that would be the same thing as z plus 2 squared. And now we have a completed square. Now we do have to be careful, right? I've added a 1 and a 4 onto the left-hand side. Uh, of course, in order to keep our equal sign here, I need to add a 1 and a 4 onto the right-hand side as well. So if I don't do that, right, I'll make a mistake and I'll get the wrong answer here. So that really should be 9 on the right-hand side, which is the same thing as 3 squared. So don't, uh, I know it's tempting to look at this and say, ah, my radius is 2, right? 
That's not quite true, right? You need to know what you're adding on to both sides and you need to wait until the end in order to figure out what your radius is. So this is going to be a sphere centered at one, zero, negative two with radius three. So there we go. Now, once we've done this rewrite, we were able to see that, yes, that fits into the exact uh, you know, formula for a sphere. Uh, and this one happens to be centered at one, zero, negative two, and has a radius of three. A quick, subtle thing that sometimes people, um, you know, if you're going too fast, you make a mistake, is that notice that there are built-in negative signs here, right? So it needs to be x minus h y minus k, z minus l, right? And so, right, notice that when I wanted a center with a point one here, right, I did x minus one. And so that one there was the x coordinate of our center, right? And it wasn't x plus one, it was x minus one, because again, the formula has a minus built into it. Um, and this again comes from our distance formula. The distance formula has minuses built into it. Um, and so same thing here. Notice the this was x minus h. So my h value was one, check. This was y minus zero, right? Or I guess I could put a k here to be kind of uh, consistent. And then this is supposed to be z minus l. Right. And so notice that I didn't put a two here. I put a negative two. And so I treated this instead of Z plus two. I just did it in my head really quick that this is the same thing as Z minus negative two. Right. And so that's why the L value there is negative two rather than positive two. It's just because that formula has some built in negative signs into it. And so, again, the point of this is just, you know, don't go too fast through these problems. Otherwise, you'd be off by a negative sign. All right, so uh, because I'm recording this afterwards, right, I was able to do all the problems and it takes as long as it takes sort of deal. But in general, if I don't get time to go over all the problems, I will post them on D2L as a PDF at very least. And of course, the problems that we do in the video are available in the video and you can rewatch those as uh, slow or fast as you want. So, all right, uh, thank you so much. And again, I apologize for the Zoom issues in class today. I uh, greatly hope that they'll be able to fix that. Uh, again, it seems like a wire or something like that because it sounded fine in class, but I, I mean, I, I went back and rewatched the video and it's uh, it's just, it's garbage. So um, again, sorry about that. Uh, thank you for watching and I will see you guys hopefully on Wednesday. All right, take care.